Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to If Day's webinar Wednesday. My name is Ron Cruz, and I'm going to be uh, talking to you about teaching algebra to GED math students, our topic for today's webinar. And again, my name is Ron Cruz. I'm a coordinator here in Hillsborough County Public Schools, and I'm also a statewide trainer for Florida If Day. If you've got any questions with regards to any parts or portion of my presentation, feel free to email me on this page. You may also download the webinar materials from the webinar page on the IFDE website. Let's start with talking about the agenda for this afternoon's webinar. We're gonna be covering the major algebraic components that are gonna be assessed on the GED test, primarily exponents and roots, undefined values over a set of real numbers, algebraic computations, sol solving algebraic inequalities, slopes, and graphing linear equations. These are the five components that we saw based on field test items are showing the greatest level of challenge uh, for students across the board, whether they're high performing or low performing. So without further ado, we're just going ahead and get started with our first item on the agenda. And like I said, these performance gaps are covered by the department uh, by GED testing service in their previous session on their Tuesday for Teachers back on October 26, 2021, and part two continued on November 16, 2021. For purposes of this webinar, there are going to be two items that we're not going to be covering in this presentation, primarily the non-calculator items and the mul multiple correct answer items. For more information regarding that, please tune in to ged.com and go into their Tuesdays for Teachers webinar archives. So for exponents and uh, roots and otherwise known as radicals, that's a performance gap that GED has found uh, very problematic for students across the board. So what I would recommend teachers is to really focus on the rules on exponents, getting students familiarized with the different uh, operations that they can do with radical with exponents. So primarily the product or multiplying exponential expressions, dividing exponential expressions, uh, raising exponential equation expressions to a power, okay, and also distributing uh, the power to a product of two expressions, same as through with finding the quotient uh, of something that is raised to a particular power, uh, any number raised to a zero power, negative powers, and then, of course, your fractional exponents that's going to lead you to uh, radical expressions. Getting students familiarized with the rule is not sufficient. You need to go over and show how these rules apply to actual examples of expressions. So I have here a table that shows you all of the different things you can, you need, students need to know uh, on how to apply the rules of exponents and the different examples on how they're being used in expressions or in particular numbers. As far as radicals, or in this case, square roots, go over some operations that students will need to be really familiar with in terms of radicals. So such as combining radicals, whether there are some or a difference of two radicals, that if the radical symbol and the index of the radical are similar, that they can easily be combined into a singular radical with the same um, index and base. So here's an example. You've got two square root of five plus six square root of five. And again, the base of the radical is the same and the index of the radical are the same here. So we can simply add the coefficients preceding the radical 2 plus 6 to get 2 plus 6 squared of 5, which simplifies to 8 squared of 5. Here's another example. In this case, it's a difference of two radicals with, again, the same base and the index of the radical. And in this case, we can simply perform the, the, the subtraction operation 
with the coefficients in front of the radical and simplify. If you can combine radicals, you can also split radicals. So uh, one example is here, uh, when a radical is raised to a power greater than two, they can be split into even numbered powers as much as you can. And in this case, it can only produce uh, one set of factors that produces at least one with an even numbered radical uh, power. And in this case, um, x squared can be evaluated on its own. And so therefore, when you take the square root of x squared, you get the absolute value of x, which technically produces two different answers here, the positive x squared of x and negative x squared of x. And here's a numeric example. And in this case, you want to split 20 into factors that have at least one perfect square as a factor. And in this case, we all know that 20 is a product of multiplying 4 and 5, where 4 is a perfect square. And so therefore, in this radical expression, we can split this expression into two radicals, which is the square root of 4 times the square root of 5. And we can easily evaluate the square root of 4, which is the absolute value of 2. Since we can no longer simplify or break 5, because 5 is a prime number, this number is now going to remain under the radical, so it remains the same answer. So here are some examples that you can use with your students to show how these splitting of products and quotients uh, apply to numbers. So again, in splitting quotients, very similar uh, you've got a numerator and a denominator all underneath the radical symbol. Uh, you can split the radical symbol between the top portion and the bottom portion. I call this first floor, first floor and second floor, so two different floors. And then you can evaluate them separately on their own to produce your answer. Now, the same rule applies for the cube root of numbers. So cube roots, very the exact same uh, rule applies. The only difference here is the index is three. So now we're taking the cube root. So I'm not going to go over this in full detail. Just wanted to show you that there are here some examples that you can use when presenting simplifying cube roots to your students. And in this case, combining similar cube roots uh, with the same base. And also with cube roots, the same rule for splitting products also apply. And in this case, we want to split this, we want to split the num uh, the expression into exponents that are factors of three so that we can easily evaluate the cube root of those expressions. And in this case, I can split x to the fourth to x cubed times x. And uh, we can evaluate this the cube root separately. We can take this cube root of x, x cubed, multiply it by the cube root of x. And in this case, this produces a perfect cube right here. So therefore, we can take the square root. And in this case, the square root of x cubed is x. And we still, since we cannot do any more, we cannot split this uh, expression underneath any more uh, to factors or, or exponents that are multiples of three, this is now going to remain by itself and we retain it. Now in number form, it's very similar. We're trying to look for uh, factors of 16 that are perfect cubes. And we all know that eight is a perfect cube. So eight times two, which is uh, when multiplied by two is produces 16. Those are really good candidates for simplification. And then we can again split the square root separately, take, I mean the cube root se separately and take the evaluate the cube root of eight, which is two. And uh, since we can no longer reduce or simplify the cube root of two, we'll keep that, uh, that factor in there. So, uh, very similar uh, rules apply for uh, sp splitting your quotients up. So again, you still have the same uh, technique where you have the first floor and the second floor underneath the square root sign. And then you evaluate the first floor and the second floor separately to produce X over Y.
And here's a numeric example that you can use for your students. Now, of course, you would want to do several exercises, different numbers, different perfect cubes, the different perfect squares with your students. So here are some uh, simplification exercises that you can try out with your students, see if they understood, uh, and I'm fully able to apply those techniques or tricks that I've shown you earlier. And here are the solutions, which is also available in your PowerPoint slides and your workbook. I often use Nearpod in class, especially now that students are able to access um, technology on their phones. I like them using their phones for academic purposes. So we use Nearpod a lot. Um, we just um, give the students a QR code to scan and then they can complete activities on Nearpod. Uh, very uh, exactly the same uh, exercises that I've shown you earlier, but only housed under Nearpod. So I'm just gonna show you what your students are gonna see. Uh, you know, if you wanted to do something in Nearpod and you wanna clone that exercise into a Nearpod activity. So here is, uh, Nearpod activity that I have saved on my computer. And in this Nearpod activity, I prepared a, an opening slide, which just um, explains to the students what they're supposed to be doing. And then uh, the problem and the instructions can be hidden, but you know, they'll have the simplification uh, example or exercise here at the top. And then the students can independently write with their fingers and give me the answer on, and I'm just picking an, an answer here, let's say an R squared. Um, they can also use type using text. Uh, and what they're gonna need in order to be able to type full advanced text is to click on the advanced feature. And in order to insert radicals, they're gonna need to type or click on insert math equation. And it will allow you to see the different uh, math equations, they're going to uh, math functions or symbols and capabilities on Nearpod. And in this case, they're most likely going to use the square root function and the cube root or the nth root function. And now let's just try the square root and insert that. And then once you've inserted that template, the students can easily type the number underneath the square root. Okay, let's try that again. Students can easily type the number underneath the square root and then insert that into your um, into the slide or into their answer. And then all they have to do is submit. Okay, so that's Nearpod for you guys. Um, another uh, thing that I'd like you to keep in mind is that exponents or roots are not only assessed in equation form or expression form, they may be assessed in terms of a word problem, just like what you're seeing right now. So we're trying to find the hypotenuse of the right triangle, and therefore we recognize that it's a right triangle. Uh, we have two legs uh, provided to us, and we're looking for the, for the length of that hypotenuse. Of course, we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem. So this must be able to um, locate the Pythagorean theorem on their formula sheet. Um, and then from that point on, it's a simple substitution here. 12 squared times five, plus 5 squared equals c squared. Uh, where all I did was sub simply substitute the length of the legs for each A and B, and it really doesn't matter which A, which is which one is A, which one is B. Uh, and then after that, uh, we evaluate the exponents. So 12 squared is gonna be 144 plus 25 equals to C squared. And then from this point, we just add the 144 plus 25 that produces that 169 total equals to c squared. So we're not done yet. So we haven't found the length of the hypotenuse yet. The, the, way, the only way we can find this 
is we if we can take the square root of both sides and we can in this case so if we take the square root of 169 and c squared we will be able to find the value of c which is the length of the hypotenuse and keep in mind that that is the absolute value of that number because we're looking for the length and length are always positive so if this problem has been provided in a non-calculator um exercise uh, students, in order for them to be able to solve this problem efficiently without a calculator, they must have memorized the first 12 perfect squares and the first six perfect cubes in order to be able to uh, manipulate their way or use the Pythagorean theorem to solve this problem. This problem will most likely appear as a non-calculator example um, on the GED test. Now let's talk about undefined uh, numbers over the set of real numbers. So that's one non-calculator item that is assessed on the GED test and it's part of the non-calculator prohibited indicators. So let's go over some of those. There are two types of undefined numbers for the set of real numbers. These are the fractions with a zero in the denominator and square roots of negative numbers. So for example, for fractions with zero in the denominator, here are some examples, negative three over zero. So you can clearly see in these two uh, examples that this, the, the, the denominator is zero. And therefore these two fractions are undefined over the set of real numbers. Uh, in this case, uh, it might require a little bit of a, uh, if we have to evaluate the uh, expression first, to find out whether the expression has a zero denominator. And in this case, if we evaluate this, when X is negative three, negative, that produces a negative three plus three in the denominator, which automatically makes this entire expression, the value of this entire expression to be undefined over the set of real number, regardless of what number is evaluated at the top. And in this case, negative three minus three on the numerator produces a negative six. Now for square roots of negative numbers, uh, we're that these are some of your examples. So here you can clearly see that you have a negative number underneath the radical sign. And in this case, the square root sign. Okay, so the index has to be two or has to be a square root. So square root of negative one is undefined over a set of real numbers. Uh, in this case, you cannot in this second example right here, x squared plus one equals zero, you won't realize that this is this expression is undefined over the set of real numbers because you still have to evaluate and solve for x in this case. So in this case, you're going to have to subtract one from both sides and then take the square root of both sides, which will end up similar to the square root of negative one and therefore is undefined over the set of real numbers. Same as through with uh, the third and uh, fourth examples where you have, again, you're going to be producing a negative number after everything is said and done. Uh, the number that will be produced under the radical symbol after evaluation will be a negative number. So just simply teach students to look out for uh, occurrences where this can happen or this may lead to a zero in the denominator or a negative number underneath the square root sign. Now let's talk about zero for a minute because I think zero is such an incredible number. Uh, it represents nothingness. Uh, yeah, uh, and if you wanna know a little bit more about what the origin of the number zero is, zero is not the first number invented uh, mathematically. Uh, zero is a number that was created after positive and negative numbers have been discovered or created. Uh, so if you want to know more about the origin of the number zero, the link to the smithsonian.com video is uh, included in your workbook so you can view it at a later time. But what I like about zero is that zero produces, I, I like zero because it's very consistent. So uh, zero produces pretty much the same or behaves the same way regardless of what you do. Like adding a zero to any number does not change that number. It's like in this example, four plus zero equals four. And same as through as subtracting, uh, it produces the same number. 
Uh, in multiplication, zero is very consistent because any number multiplied by zero is automatically zero. And then uh, in division, if the numerator or in fractions, if the numerator is zero, that fraction is automatically equal to zero, just like in this example, zero over three equals zero. And of course, as we talked about a little bit earlier, that any, any fraction with a zero denominator is undefined over the set of real numbers. So that's also another perfect quality of zero. And then any number raised to a zero, I mean, as zero raised to any number is still a zero. So that's another consistent behavior that the zero does. And any number raised to a zero power results to a single number, which is always gonna be one. So just like in this example, seven raised to the zero power equals one. This examples and tables are derived from mathisfun.com, which is my go-to place for a lot of uh, fun exercises and graphics for my students. The only problem that we have with zero is again, we cannot divide by zero. It's really no way you can divide anything by nothing. Uh, so it, it doesn't make any sense. But if you want to really know why zero, why you cannot divide by zero, um, I provided a YouTube link for you to watch, you know, for your own entertainment. You can watch this YouTube link and uh, find out and really have some very interesting information to share with you, with your student as to why you cannot divide by zero. And that video was developed by Ted Ed. Um, let's talk about the other numbers, the other set of numbers that are undefined over the set of real numbers, which is imaginary numbers. So imaginary numbers, again, are those numbers that are undefined under the under set of real numbers uh, that results to a negative number underneath the radical symbol uh, with an index of two. So it's a square root uh, of negative numbers. So um, let's just do a mental exercise real quick. If we try to square numbers to see if we can get any negative result, uh, you'll re you'll realize that it's in, it's impossible. You cannot square any two numbers and produce a negative number. So here are just some of the trials that I did. One squared produces a positive number one. Zero squared is always a zero, just like one of those properties we discussed. If you raise a negative two to a second power or you multiply a negative two by itself, you still produce a positive number. And even in decimal cases, you still are going to uh, result in a positive uh, number or a positive decimal number. So there, there is no possibility that we can use any real number, a fraction, a decimal, and produce a negative result when you square them or when you multiply it by itself. So, but let's imagine that that's possible. And let's call that number, quote unquote, number, uh, an imaginary number. So let's pretend that there is this number and we're gonna call that number I. And so if we call that number I, which stands for imaginary, and that I, when multiplied to itself, will produce a negative number. And in this case, let's just, for conversation's sake, let's pretend that it's a negative one, okay? So if we have this, relationship of i squared, uh, which is equal to i times i, or i multiplied to itself, produces a negative number, something that we couldn't create before in the set of real numbers, uh, then we can also do this. We can take the square root of this expression, this entire expression, and produce what we're trying to avoid earlier, which is a negative number underneath the square root, okay? So now once we do this, we now arrive at the, uh, at the real value of what that number is, that I that we represented earlier, that imaginary number that we're talking about. And then at first, uh, mathematicians thought of this as just a mental exercise for them. They have nothing better to do. Uh, they wanna kill time a little bit and they try to experiment with these numbers. But what they don't realize is that once they figured out or came up with this imaginary number i, which is equal to the square root of negative one, once they started playing around it a little bit more, they discovered that they are opening a new areas 
new areas in mathematics that they haven't discovered before. It kind of filled the gap in their mathematical understanding and, uh, and, and became of good use. Uh, the word imaginary just stuck in their head. So they just kept the, the letter I. I is exclusively used to represent for mathematicians as the square root of negative one. But the true power of imaginary number comes when they're combined with real numbers like two plus three I or negative one plus six I. And again, I being the square root of negative one. As here's another example, seven minus five I. These are what we call complex numbers and complex numbers uh, gave birth to a whole new branch of mathematics, which is called complex mathematics, which is beyond the scope of the GED test, of course, but this is just um, to illustrate to you why is it so important for students to understand or to determine when a number is undefined over the set of real numbers. Now, does it have any real life, real world application? Of course, real numbers uh, again, like I said, opened the doors to studying uh, a whole new gap or a, a, a gap in mathematics that haven't been discovered uh, during that time. And because of how re, uh, imaginary numbers behave, uh, it's, it behaves in a very cyclical fashion when you keep raising it to a power. So for example, I squared, I cubed, I to the fourth, I to the fifth, and you keep going on and on, you're going to get a cyclical set of four numbers all the time. And it keeps just repeating itself. And in that repetition pattern, we're able to uh, use imaginary numbers to model frequencies and sound. And these things will not be possible without the study of complex numbers or imaginary numbers. Audio Jungle. Audio jungle. So in this case, um, we are able to model sound visually which is only something that we can hear. We're able to model sounds and convert those uh, into a more like an equalizer. It's what we call an equalizer uh, screen on your stereo. We, we probably don't have uh, equalizers anymore. They don't build this uh, into uh, systems, only classic, uh, 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 classic uh, devices do have these, but uh, the this display will not be possible without uh, the use of um, imaginary numbers, and uh, it's and it's also that cyclical property of imaginary numbers that lets allows us to also model electricity, not just sound. So a lot of waves are being modeled uh, through the use of uh, complex numbers or complex vectors. So this is pretty complex, but I don't want you to try to explain this to your students. But how I would want to go about is that there is significant importance of these what we call quote unquote imaginary numbers because we won't be able to tap on and study current and how electricity behaves and also sound without the aid of those tools, which was a gap in mathematics during that time. Now let's uh, tune in, uh, let's, let's switch over to algebraic computations, which is also another challenging aspect for students. Uh, what I'd like for teachers to focus on is uh, to focus on two fundamental rules in solving equations, okay? Always our goal is to isolate that variable, keep that variable, whatever it is, x, y, z, in one side of the equation and all by itself, and then try to move all the other numbers to the other side of the equation. And while you're doing that, um, there are also things that you can do. OK, so you can add and subtract the same value from both sides in order to do that. You can clear out any fractions on the expressions or equations by multiplying every term by whatever whatever is your denominator or your least common multiple. If you have varying denominators, if you can also divide every term by the same non-zero value 
to kind of uh, uh, shrink down the numbers, especially if they're very large. You can combine all similar terms. You can do factor. You can factor expressions in such a way you can cancel items out of the equation. Uh, you can expand, which is the opposite of factoring. So you can expand expressions. Sometimes expressions need to be expanded so you can really see that uh, certain uh, expressions can be canceled out. Um, students also need to understand that they can, they need to recognize a pattern. Uh, they need to be able to see whether what they're looking at is a difference of squares or are they looking at a perfect square trinomial. Um, so those are two, you know, that's one thing that I always practice my students. Sometimes I would reorder uh, the terms in a polynomial so that they're not so used to always seeing the difference of two squares in, in the form of x squared plus y, uh, x squared minus y squared. Uh, and then last but not the least, this is something that so students often forget that they can do, is that they can always try to square or take the square root of both sides. Because sometimes when you do and apply another function to both sides of the equation, it reveals other things that you, they may or may not be able to do on uh, on the equation and allows them to simplify it even further and really isolate that variable. So those are the things that you want to go over with the students what they can do. And then, of course, you're going to have to give them some examples of this uh, and show them that by adding and subtracting the same value from both sides, it does not change the overall value of the equation. So you're going to have to want to give an example of each rule. But of course, in every, you know, in in the most likely situation, they're probably going to apply two or more combinations of these to fully isolate that variable and solve the equation. So, also fundamental properties that students need to really understand is that addition property that looks like this and various, again, this is one of what we talked about in the previous slide, that what they can do to an equation without um, changing the overall, the overall value of the expression. Also multiplying the same number, very, it's the same as what we discussed earlier in the slide, but there is an actual name for that property that they're using. Uh, distributive property is another thing that they need to be fully, immersed in and uh, they have a lot of practice with uh, because I've seen this used many, many ways and in many, many applications in word problems. Associative property is not so much. Very rarely do I see associative property applied when solving equations. And usually it involves a little bit more than just associating singular numbers. It's more like associating factors in order for you to do more complex factoring techniques. And then, of course, we go into factoring techniques. So sometimes the only way to solve the equation is to factor it. Of course, you've got for quadratic, for quadratic equations, you can always use your quadratic formula, which is uh, included on the uh, GED um, formula sheet. So you can all students always can come back to it and use that. But sometimes using the quadratic formula is very time consuming and it's very prone to error uh, as compared to some of the proven techniques for factoring, such as greatest common factor is one. Uh, so this is just the distributive property in reverse. So practice factoring with the greatest common factor. And if you cannot factor using the greatest common factor, meaning there is no common factor between every term of uh, the expression, it could be just only a group of terms within the entire polynomial that can be factored. So then therefore grouping would be another technique. And then from the grouping, you can apply the greatest common factor uh, method on each grouping to produce a more unique um, uh, factor set. And then from here, we can even further uh, find the greatest common factor of these two uh, using the binomial 3x minus 2. And now you're able to fully factor the expression 3x squared minus 2x plus 12x minus 8 
uh, and really find the, the zeros of this uh, expression and find out the value or evaluate that uh, ex um, equation. There are, of course, some special forms that your students would need to know, and those are the difference of two squares. Uh, you know, this knowing these special forms speed up the factoring process or the simplification process for the students. And also the second one of these special forms within the scope of GED testing is the perfect square trinomial. Uh, you know, having them master this and going back and forth between the two forms of the perfect square trinomial in the factored form and the standard form, uh, students should be able to factor quickly between these two special forms uh, because they could tend to be very time consuming, especially if you're using uh, the quadratic formula to evaluate. Uh, for exercises and techniques to help your students with all of the factoring ideas that we just covered, I always, my go-to place is Desmo. Uh, Desmo has a ton of teacher-created uh, exercises. This one, I want to give credit to Ms. Uh, Kathy Henderson, who developed this Desmo classroom activity for finding, uh, uh, for factoring uh, expressions uh, in terms and, and, and incorporating uh, area as well. So you can see from this screen, some of the screens that you are, you got a you got an expression or you got a polynomial that needs to be factored to find out the different factors and the lengths of the dimensions of each rectangle. Okay, so it's more like an activity and it increases in complexity. So this is two, they're gonna factor two expressions. Here they have three expressions to factor. And then here they have uh, uh, four expressions to factor, and then they have an unknown area over here that they have to find out. So it gets really, really challenging. And then think about what if, if it looks like this. So uh, the link to this particular Desmo activity, you can use it, clone it, copy it, and give it to your students. It is not advisable to be used on mobile devices, but it could be, it will be just because of the size of the print. Uh, tablet and laptop are most advised for this exercise, but the link to this exercise is included in your resources on the last page of the workbook on your webinar page. Uh, solving algebraic inequalities, also another challenging area for students. They need to be able to uh, do four different things in order to solve uh, quadratic, I mean, uh, inequalities. Uh, so they need to be able to solve linear inequalities, graph them, and then solve real world problems and write the uh, write expressions uh, to represent a particular scenario. So in this case, here's an example, very classic example. So this just needs to know that, that there is a relationship between your budget and your expenditure. And in this case, the total cost should always be less than or equal to your budget or your budget should be at least greater than or, or at least equal to what is your expected cost. And this is gonna be the general template for establishing or writing an, uh, an inequality uh, for to represent a real world scenario. So in this case, we simply find out what we're looking for in the problem, what is our budget? What is the cost? The cost is derived from the number of people attending the meeting and the cost of renting the meeting room. Of course, we don't know uh, what uh, that the X value is, and that's what we're trying to look for here, uh, is how much can we allocate per person. Uh, and then from that point on, it's just setting up the inequality by substituting from this general uh, relationship that we established. Now, one thing that I would advise teachers to do is you know, to show to the students that solving equations and solving inequalities are no, I know not very different. Uh, there's except for a couple of cases. So show to them that uh, on a side by side model, uh, you know, on the left, I have an equation and on the right, I have an inequality, but the numbers are exactly the same. The only difference here is one is inequality and the other one is 
an equation. And I solved the equation first on the left by uh, subtracting 15 on both sides and then dividing by three on both sides. And then we're down to X equals three. And then if we go to the right, you'll see that if I perform the same rules that we applied and we discussed earlier, everything, all the properties that we can uh, perform on inequalities, that it behaves exactly the same way. Okay, so now we end up with the same value, but this is not really two of the same value. The process is the same, but 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 the end result are two different numbers because on the left side, which is an inequality, your answer is going to be a point on the number line, okay, which is that point number three. Now, if you look on the right side, we're not only talking about a singular number here, we're talking about every single number that are greater than or equal to three. So that's three, four, five, and every number above that and keeps on and on. And every single number in between, every single real number in between. So that's how we represent that. We have pretty much an infinite number of solutions on, uh, on the right side or on the inequality side. So we represent it usually using a number line and we either use a shaded in circle or an open circle if it's if it's there's no equality underneath the the greater than symbol um so yes um uh, so again very different in result but the process is the same except for one or two instances and that's uh in this case this example that i'm going to show you is that if we simplify negative 3x minus 15 greater than or equal to 24, a very similar process adding 15 of both sides. And then in this case, we're dividing both sides by negative 3 in order to really isolate that variable. Well, what you'll notice is in here, I, as soon as I started dividing both sides by 3, I immediately flipped the inequality symbol. Do you notice? It was a greater than or equal symbol now, and now it's a less than or equal symbol. This is most, most students often forget to flip that inequality sign when they're multiplying or dividing by negative numbers. And the reason why, and so now we're done here solving this inequality, but the reason why students do not remember how is probably because we do not explain why, uh, why, why it's so. So what I'm going to go over in the next minute, 60 seconds, is why, why do you flip the inequality symbol when you're dividing by zero? I mean, when you're, um, when you're working with an inequality. So here's an example. Let's just take two numbers, A and B. Uh, and in this case, uh, I just arbitrarily assigned two numbers, A and B. Okay, it could be any two numbers. Uh, and, but in this case, uh, B is equal to negative three and A is equal to positive two. And in this case, B is definitely less than A. Now, what happens is when you're multiplying, dividing uh, an inequality by any number that are negative, uh, just like, for example, by negative one, what happens is you're not only multiplying the number to A and B, you're also applying that same process to the entire number line, which essentially uh, flips the number line and moves all your negative numbers to the right and all your positive numbers to the left and relocating those A's and B's where they are, their locations also flip and therefore the inequality symbol flips. So before we started off with a less than symbol, now we're ending up with a greater than symbol because we multiplied both sides by negative one. Slopes and graphing linear equations is the last topic I'm going to discuss. But when you're pre presenting slope, you're going to have to present slope in multiple different instances in a real life sense. Show them that the study of slope needs two points, just like any line. And it's just simply the rise over run of this line. Uh, they can also uh, break down slope according to the uh, formula for slope, which is the difference of the coordinates. Uh, uh, and so, and this is also included in their formula sheet if they forgot. Um, but you need really technically two numbers to determine the slope using the slope formula. 
or two sets of ordered pair. Uh, and in this case, we can also use the rise over run very quickly to very quickly find the slope. So the rise is negative because it's dropping. So this one is dropping by three. So it's a negative three. And then it's running by up to one, two, three, four, five spaces. So the slope is negative three over five. Slope could also be, again, evaluated using the slope formula. And this is how I evaluated the slope formula and produced the same answer using the ordered pairs for the two points on the number line. And in this case, I used that slope to generate an equation of a line. And in this case, this is a slope intercept equation of a line. Uh, in order to generate this, of course, you're gonna need that Y intercept, that number where the Y axis intersects the line. And in this case, 4.6. And then also, you can also um, describe slope using a set of uh, ordered pairs to show the, 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 that. So is slope important? Of course, slope is very important, especially for these guys in the middle. So we will have to study slope. But just a quick technique here for slope. It's important for you guys to understand that the slope intercept form the point slope form and the standard form has to be mastered by the student, all of which are, I think, included on your formula sheet. Uh, explain to the student what each variable meant and give them a picture or an example of what each represents. I always use the GeoGebra app in order to show my students uh, the different types of slopes. And in this case, I can use a, um, I can manipulate the equation to, let's say, increase the y-intercept. Here, what happens to the line? And then what happens to the line if I go more negative? And then if I go positive? So then the students can e actually see what's happening to the line and what's happening to the slope. Uh, you know, based on the picture of a line. So I always use GeoGebra. And the link to this activity is also included on your work, workbook. I develop an anchor chart for students to, for my students to use so that they know how to find slope at every different instance that is given to them. So here's an example of a, uh, uh, finding a slope when they're given a table of values, finding a slope when they're given the slope intercept, which is the easiest way of finding the slope. Now uh, here is uh, finding the slope using standard form. And here is finding the slope using a graph, uh, a graphical representation of the line. Uh, I also use Nearpod for these activities. I have my students graph in Nearpod, but I also try to do more fun activities with my students because I need them to be able to practice more and more slopes until they really master the technique for finding slope for different equations or graphs or lines. So um, I, we, we often play Battleship. So the link to the Battleship uh, template is on your uh, workbook as well. Uh, for students that do like solving riddles, there's a riddle exercise for slopes also included. The link to that worksheet is also included in your workbook. And last but not the least, I just wanted to give you an example where uh, students might be tested not on a actual value of a slope, but just how, uh, if they can sketch and use their knowledge of slope to sketch a particular situation. So here are four different scenarios where uh, slope is being used and being represented. And this is just a sketched graph. So there's really no values included here, but there are gonna be certain times on the test where they're gonna only be asked to pick which graph or sketch accurately or most best estimates the behavior of what is being stated in the problem or in the situation. So in this case, I developed uh, four different uh, shapes that it could produce with varying uh, slopes, some with positive, some with negative slopes, some with, with very high number of slopes and some with very low number of slopes and how they represent, they're represented in real life. So those are pretty much what I really concentrate on on the GED test when I'm trying to prepare my students to become more successful on, um, on equations and slopes uh, 
for that part. So please focus on these things. And I think you're going to gain a lot uh, with your students and they will perform better on the GED test. Uh, for questions, feel free to reach out to my email. My email is in the first slide of your PowerPoint slide that you can download from the If They website on the webinar page. Uh, and with that said, I wanted to say thank you for tuning in for this afternoon, spending your time with us, and we'll see you again on our next webinar Wednesday. Have a wonderful rest of the day.